This morning's sermon is entitled, The Storms of Life. <coughs> we refer to events in our lives that cause us either pain or confusion or other maladies, storms, figuratively speaking. A storm of life could be a loss of a job. A storm of life could be uh, developing some sort of sickness, disease. But we all go through times in our lives that are stormy-like. The figure applies because when we're in a rainstorm, let's say, and it's raining heavily, even with your windshield wipers on, sometimes it's hard to see clearly during those times. Sometimes it's hard to stay on the right side of the road during a storm. Obviously during storms we slow down because we can't go the, our normal speed. Things are hindering us, keeping us from going the speed we'd like to. So storms of life obviously hinder us in different ways and we refer to different things as storms in our lives. I thought we'd look at some actual storms that we read about in the Bible and see how those individuals dealt with those storms so that we might apply those actions to our lives today when difficult times arise for us. The first storm we read about really this is in Genesis chapter 6. Perhaps the greatest storm ever to hit the earth, right? Flooded the entire world above the highest of trees. In Genesis chapter 6, the Bible tells us why this storm arose. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to men. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Here the Bible tells us that individuals who at least at one point in time had been obedient to God began to intermingle and even intermarry with individuals who were against God. And throughout uh, Bible history and his history itself, we know that when individuals uh, unequally yoke themselves with those who are of the world, it's less likely that they remain faithful and more likely that they fall away. And when these individuals began to associate uh, with those who were ungodly, here referred to as the, either the children of men or the sons of men, those were individuals who were not of God or obedient to God. The Bible says in verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. So it was true that even those individuals who at one time had been faithful to God had fallen away. So why did the storm come? Well, the storm came because people left God. Sometimes uh, storms in our lives are, are of our own doing, aren't they? Sometimes storms in our lives are because we uh, perhaps uh, set them off. Here the Bible says this storm started because men had left God. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so he brought a great storm. Fortunately for one man and his family, verse 8, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found the grace in the eyes of the Lord because he had remained faithful to God. But you know what? He still had to go through the storm, didn't he? The storm may have not been of his choosing, right? The storm wasn't necessarily of his causing. But he still had to go through the storm. <coughs> Learning how Noah goes through this storm may be a way in which we can apply it to our lives, how to deal with going through a stormy time in our life. 
In verse 12, the Bible says, God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted His way upon the earth. You'll remember that God made everything good. Man came along and corrupted it. But God said to Noah in verse 13, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms thou shalt make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without. And here's the fashion or the pattern in which you need to build this ark. The first thing that Noah did in order to survive this stormy part in his life was he was prepared for the storm. Wasn't he? God said, I'm going to send a storm. God said, I'm going to send a storm and here's how you can make it through the storm. The Bible tells us that in the last days, that's the days we're living in today, the Christian age, that there'll be individuals who fall away from the truth. There'll be false teachers. There'll be individuals who uh, try to deceive us and to lead us in any which way. And the Bible has told us that there'll be individuals who will seek for themselves teachers who'll, who will scratch their ears and teach them whatever they want to hear. And the Bible tells us that there'll be individuals who will do whatever they please and that they will uh, do things their way and that bad things will come because of it. Well, the Bible tells us that we ought to be prepared for that, right? <laughs> Noah was prepared because God told him these things were going to happen. God told us what was going to happen ultimately, didn't He? He didn't tell us specific things, right? But He told us, generally speaking, here's what's going to happen in the last days. And so how did He say how to prepare how did he tell us to prepare? He told uh, Noah to build an ark. And he said, you need to build that ark exactly how I tell you to build it. And then he said, get in the ark. And I'm going to shut you in the ark. And don't get out until I say get out. The Lord built the church. Jesus said he would build his church. And he said upon this rock, the rock solid foundation that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, the gates of hell would not prevail against it. God has given us an ark, if you will, to get into the church. A place of safety from the storm, a refuge, right? And He says, here's how it's to be built. Here's how it's to be fashioned. Here's the pattern in which you'll find the church. And we read through the New Testament and we find a pattern. There are many churches out there today, but they don't follow the pattern, right? Right? They don't follow the same fashion that God gave. Their ark will sink one day because they didn't build it according to the pattern. In Genesis chapter 6, when God told Noah how to build something and where to go when the storm came, Noah, verse 22, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. Well, when God prepared Noah and warned Noah, what did Noah do? He did what God told him to do. Well, the Bible tells us if you want to be saved from your past sins, you need to get out of the world and into the church. And He tells us how to get into the church. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so we find out that getting into the church and getting into Christ is the same thing. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And that obedience to the gospel is the only way we get into the ark today, the church. And it has to be the right ark. It has to be the ark that was built exactly as God told us how to build it. And we know that the church today is not a physical structure. It's a spiritual structure. It's a structure made uh, for spiritual people. And when we do that which is right with God and we follow the pattern of God, we find us a place to hide in a time of storm. And so what we learn from Noah is that when God warns us, we accept the warning seriously. When God tells us where to go for safety, we go there for safety. And when God says that it has to be a certain place, that's where we go. We don't make our own ark. We don't devise our own plans for arks. We get in the ark of God. Noah getting into the ark of God saved him and his family. Getting into the church today will save you and your family. God has made a place to hide or to hold out the storm, right? 
We also know that back in Noah's day, there were individuals that laughed at the storm. They scorned Noah for getting into the ark. There are people who scorn people for getting into the church today. There are people who mock individuals who try to do things according to patterns. They mock, they laugh, they joke, but when the door is shut and the rain began to fail, they were not prepared, were they? So on one hand, we had Noah and his family. They heard the warning. They believed the warning. They heeded the warning. They did what God said to do, and they were saved. Then we have a large multitude of people on the outside of the ark who laughed and mocked and scorned, not prepared for the storm. And when the storm came, the door was shut and they drowned. They were lost. On the day of judgment, those who have not got into the church will be like those on the outside of the ark. They will drown. They're not prepared. So what is our role today as we look at Noah and those around him? We need to heed the warnings and we need to prepare. We also read of a great storm that came in, Noah, uh, in Jonah's day. Jonah, having been a prophet of God, though at the end of the book we question whether he was faithful to God. That will be between him and God. But Jonah found himself in the midst of a great storm. Once again, Jonah found himself in the storm because of his own doings. Noah was really in the storm because of others' doings. Jonah was in the storm because of his own doings. Now there were others with Jonah, weren't they? <laughs> they were in the storm too. Jonah had been told to go to Nineveh and to preach the gospel and to turn those individuals to call upon them to repent because of Jonah's prejudice and perhaps other evil attitudes he refused to go to Nineveh he disobeyed God he got on a ship and went the exact opposite direction to Tarshish and a great storm arose a great wind arose. In verse 9 of Jonah chapter 1, Jonah says, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do to thee, that the sea may be calm to us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said to them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land. But then finally, verse 16, the Bible says, or in verse 15, So took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Jonah brought this storm of life upon himself because he had totally disobeyed God. He had totally gone against the wishes of God. And in order for this storm to cease for him and others, he had to, number one, acknowledge his sin. He had to accept the consequence of his sin. Though he repented of his sin, he still had to be cast over into the sea. And the Bible tells us that the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, to give Jonah a nice, comfortable place to think. Right? <laughs> now, I suppose that that was not a very comfortable place. It was probably not a very clean place. It was probably not a very ar aromatic place. Place. But God made a place for Jonah during this time up to, after the storm to think, to contemplate. And in chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, Jonah prayed to the Lord. <coughs> Jonah disobeyed God. A storm 
arose because of his disobedience, Jonah had to accept the consequence of his sin, acknowledge that he had done wrong, repent of that sin, and then he prayed to God. Though we, don't know, though we do not know about Jonah's later life, I am convinced that at this point he did repent. God knew his heart and allowed that whale to vomit him up on dry land. He then went to do what God had told him to do. During this storm, we learn from Jonah that we can't run from God. The storm will only get worse. If we do run from God, we can get others involved in the storm who were not really, who were really innocent of the storm. We can cause others to be uh, uh, affected by our storm, our sin. And the only way to get the storm to stop is to acknowledge our sin, to repent of that sin, to accept the consequence of the sin, and ask God to forgive us. In Mark chapter 4, a great storm arose. Verse 37, there arose a great storm of wind. The waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow and they awoke him and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and he rebuked the wind and he said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm and he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus' disciples were caught in a storm and they did not know what to do. It's amazing that these individuals who were probably very adept at sailing because most of the disciples were fishermen. They were on boats a lot. It tells us that even individuals who know a lot about their trade can sometimes lose their wit during a storm. <laughs> How many individuals say, I've been a Christian for 25, 30 years in response to some action or thing they've done. Well, even a Christian of 25, 30, 40 years can slip up. Even a mature Christian can lose his way on the sea when it's stormy. Right? Here are these disciples, men of the sea, knew how to take care of ships, knew how to get in and out of waves and storms. They lost their way, didn't they? It's as if they had never been on a ship before at all. You know, if you're ever on a ship, I suppose you'd want your captain to have been through about everything. I know when you get on a plane, you want your pilot to have been through about everything. You don't want your pilot going, what do we do now? <laughs> right? What do we do now? It reminds us that during storms, we can make bad decisions. Or it may be the case that we're in a position where we ought not be making decisions at all. Right? We might need to get some help, get some good counsel from individuals who are uh, right, more right thinking at that time, right? Most even in the secular world who study things of this nature say that people who go through traumatic things should wait a good while before making big decisions. A lot of people have made bad things worse by making bad decisions when they weren't thinking clearly. <coughs> Jesus' disciples knew they should have known what they were to do, right? They, were, they knew how to sail. They'd been on boats before. They'd been on the sea before. The 
they finally go to Jesus, which is what we ought to do first and foremost. But when we go to Jesus, when we go to God, perhaps we ought to go to Him with a different attitude, right? These men said, Lord, do you not care that we're about to perish? That's a funny question, isn't it? That's a funny question. Here's these individuals. <laughs> of course He cared. Perhaps they should have gone to Him first. Perhaps they should have said, Lord, the storm is rising and uh, we could use some help. Their faith in God was not as strong as they thought it was. In verse 41, the Bible says, They feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this? A follower? It says that there were disciples in the ship. They referred to him as master. They didn't really know what manner of man this was, did they? It kind of goes back to Noah. Are we prepared? Do we know who God is? Do we know the Lord? Do we study enough that when we are through these uh, storms of life that we know who we're going to for help? We should know that God is able to say, peace be still, shouldn't we? Now we might have to get swallowed by a whale. And we might have to stay there for a few days. And we might have to be vomited up on dry land, right? That doesn't mean, when Jesus says, peace be still, it doesn't mean that we don't have to go through some bad things. It just means that the storm will come to an end eventually. But when we go to the Lord, do we go to the Lord knowing that He has the power and the ability to do it? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Sometimes the people who claim to have the most faith have the least. It's easy to look faithful when times are good, right? But during the times of storm, how do we look? How do we act? How do we respond? These men panicked. And if you panic in a storm, it's only going to get worse. We have individuals in Noah's day that were not prepared and they were lost. Days, uh, those in Jonah's situation accepted the consequence of his sin and he prayed to God. These disciples panicked, but they eventually went to the source of safety and peace. Lastly, in Acts chapter 27, for our purpose this morning anyway, I'm sure we could look at many examples. But in Acts chapter 27, we read of one of Paul's shipwrecks. <clears throat> Verse 9 of Acts chapter 27, the Bible says, When much time was spent, when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our own lives. Now here's a man with experience and wisdom and knowledge, even if you didn't accept him as a man of God, right? And he says, look, my experience tells us that this is a bad idea to get on this boat and get on this water. But notice verse 11. Nevertheless, <laughs> is it times that we have individuals give us warning or give us ideas and thoughts and we just scoot them to the side? Nevertheless, we hear... You know, these warnings or these heeds, the consequence of our actions or potential consequence of what we're about to do and we just throw it to the side like it was old, rotting meat, right? Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship. 
right? He believed others over Paul more than the things that were spoken by Paul. Verse 14, the Bible says, not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called the Eurachlodon. That must have been caused by man-made global warming. <laughs> when the ship was caught, verse 15, and could not bear up in the wind, they had no choice, right, but to let it drive. And everybody was afraid. They did everything they knew to do to keep the ship safe. Verse 18, we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day, this wasn't a, an hour long thing or a two hour long thing, was it? This was a long storm. The third day, verse 19, our hands, the tackling of the ship, neither sun nor stars in many days appeared. It was a storm of great proportion, wasn't it? Literally, biblical proportion. No small tempest lay upon us. And all hope that should... Uh, it says, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. These men were sure they were going to die in this storm. There is no hope for us in this storm. But after a long abstinence, the man who gave the good advice to begin with, probably a long absence because he said, well, they didn't listen to me the first time. Why would they listen to me now? But finally, Paul, I guess, he saw, well, the time's come for me to speak again. <laughs> he stood forth in the midst of them and he said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. Now, I suppose they already knew that. And Paul didn't tell them that to uh, say, I'm right and you're wrong, but he did rebuke them, and they deserved it to be rebuked. But now verse 22, and he's also saying, look, I was right. You didn't listen to me then, but maybe you'll listen to me now. Verse 22, so now I exhort you to be of good cheer. What's in the past is in the past, Paul said. You made the bad decision in the past. Now we have to go from here, where we're at. We can't make decisions now based on three days ago. The storm's already here. Now we've got to deal with the storm. You know, We could have been safe from the storm if we hadn't got out here in the first place. <laughs> but now we're in the storm. We can't deal with that. We have to deal with the now. And the now is we're in the middle of a storm and there's no hope of us being saved. Or is there? Paul says, Now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me in this night an angel of God whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told to me, howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. Now, God doesn't speak to us miraculously today like He spoke to Paul, but He speaks to us through His Word. And those men who wrote this were inspired of God. And they did have angels come and talk to them. And we can believe their Word because we know that they were of God. That they were eyewitnesses of the Lord. And when Paul says a thing, we ought to heed it, shouldn't we? They didn't hearken to it the first time, though they should have. But we ought to hearken to it, shouldn't we? Then drop down to verse 31. Everybody's thinking every man for himself, right? Jump ship. If you live, you live. If you die, you die. Every man for himself. And Paul says, verse 31, Except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. You know, when we started this lesson, we talked about getting into the ark, the ship. That's the only place that those people could be saved from the storm. 
Today we said that the ark of God is the church. That's the only place we can go to be saved. In the church. And if we want to stay saved, we have to stay in the ship, don't we? Paul said, except they abide in the ship, they'll all be lost. There are many people who get into the ark today and then for whatever reason, they leave the ark. They leave the church. They may not leave it in physicality. They may take up a seat in a pew, but their mind is far from here. <laughs> Doing whatever they want to do, right? Living how they want to live. Saying what they want to say. Some physically leave. They don't abide in the ship. Paul said, except you abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Once you find safety from the storm, you better stay safe. You better do all that you can to remain in the ship. Safety was in that ship. Safety was where God's Word was. God's Word was represented by Paul the Apostle. When you go somewhere and God's word ain't, you know you're not the ark. You're not in the ark of God. When you go somewhere and they're not following the fashion or the pattern that God gave, you know you're not in the ark of God. There are some ships that need to be sunk. <laughs> there are some people that need to leave their ship, and they need to get into the ark of God. This time they listened to Paul, didn't they? You know, this is a good story. At least they learned from their past mistake, right? They could have been as hard-headed this time as they were the first time and said, no, we're going to do things our way this time just like we did it our way the first time. But you know what would have happened? They would have all sunk with the ship. Except you abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Paul was a prisoner on this ship during this storm. It lasted more than 14 days. Some storms in our lives are short, some are long, right? We have to endure them all. Paul here is a good lesson during a storm too, isn't he? <coughs> Paul was very discreet. He spoke when he needed to speak. He stayed silent when he needed to be silent. But he had a great influence on those around him, didn't he? They didn't listen to him the first time, but he stayed with it. And he said, they didn't listen to me the first time, but maybe this time they will. And they did. And because of Paul's influence, the ship was saved. His influence of faith in God led to others being saved. He encouraged them to be of good cheer. You know, as Christians, sometimes we have to give people bad news. But it ought to be followed up by immediate good news. You may be lost today, but you don't have to be lost very long. <laughs> you may not be in the right ark today, but you don't have to be in the wrong ark very long. Be of good cheer. God has given us a way to be saved. God's given us everything we need to know to be saved. God wants you to be saved. Hear God's Word. Be obedient to it and be saved. Be of good cheer, right? Even in the middle of a storm. <laughs> we fight all manner of storms. There are many storms in our lives. Famines, financial problems, family problems, disease tragedies, trials, temptations. I think these examples can give us a few ideas of how to make it through the storms. Make it through the storms. Know the storm is coming. Be prepared for the storm. Know that God will help us in the storm if we are faithful to Him. Don't leave God out of the equation. Don't panic. And make sure you're doing things God's way. Don't have a nevertheless in your sentence. 
Bible tells us today if you're not one of His children that you can be by hearing the Word of God, believing it, repenting of your past sins, confessing that Jesus is the Christ and being baptized in water to have your past sins washed away. The Lord will add you to His church, the ark, the place of safety, right, from the storm. And if you'll remain faithful to God from that day on, if you'll do what God says to do, if you'll be faithful to Him, if you'll be His servant, when the Lord returns, He will call you up to heaven to live with Him in eternity. That's why we're here today, is to be faithful to God, to do what God has to say, to be pleasing to God. When the storms of life arise, turn to the Bible. Do things God's way. Be prepared and do things God's way. If you are already a Christian but have something that has separated you from God, if it's of a private nature, you can take care of that privately. If there's anything we can assist you with, well, certainly we would love to help as we stand and sing. God is